so what he was dragging was behind the car when you saw it the first time. I know it was beside the car in a ditch. This is a 10-year-old Todd Terrell who becomes the key witness to unlocking a heinous crime. As darkness threatened justice, this young observer's bravery and resilience proved pivotal, cracking the code of a mother's murder. This captivating tale weaves the innocence of childhood with the gravity of crime, reminding us that sometimes the smallest voices can make the biggest difference. Our story begins in the village of Colon, Michigan. Colon is very rural with a population of around 1,200. It's May 10th, 1985. A telephone technician starts his day by checking poles and phone lines. He notices something in the ground. It is dark and appears to be wet. He leans down to get a better look, just below the ground surface. He spots what he believes to be blue jeans. Flies were swirling around the area. He made out what looked to be the flesh of a decomposing body. He immediately got into his work truck, drove to the nearest phone, and called law enforcement. Detective Sergeant Robin Baker of the St. Joseph County Sheriff's Office arrived on the scene. Detective Baker recalled seeing a belt and skin in what was a shallow grave. Initially, all they knew was that the body was face down. Prime scene technicians are called in to begin the exclamation. This process took hours as the team meticulously searched through the dirt looking for any evidence. They unearthed the body of a white female. She was decomposed to the, the extent that alternative means of identification were required. However, the clothing she was found in matched a missing person's report from eight weeks prior on the other side of the county. At the time, no one else was reported missing, so they believed it was the woman missing out of Three Rivers, Michigan. Three Rivers is a centrally located town amongst Three Rivers Portage the Rocky and the St. Joseph Rivers, with a population of around 8,000 most residents know each other. The quiet and safe community is where a local couple falls in love. Bruce Van Buskirk, a Three Rivers police officer, met and eventually married Linda Jacobs. Linda was known as a strong Christian woman. The couple had two daughters. Bruce and Linda's marriage was good for a few years, but it ultimately didn't stand the test of time. The relationship was splintered by infidelity, and a rather contentious divorce followed, now a single mother. Linda was taking care of her girls with the help of her parents. She was in the process of getting her life back together. Linda rented a house on Day Road in a rural area of Three Rivers. Jim Briney met Linda at their local church. Jim said that Linda was resilient, independent, and smart. He offered his home as a place to stay because he traveled for work when he was in the area. He would stay with Linda's parents, Paul and Evelyn. Linda accepted Jim's offer and moved herself and her girls into his house. Linda, financially struggling at the time, started a lemonade stand with her girls. She also sold other baked goods out of the home. Jim then said that whenever Linda had some time to herself, she would walk the nearby trails. March 26, 1985, with her parents watching her kids, the 26-year-old mother heads off on her walk. It was a beautiful 70-degree day, but as the sun set, Linda had not shown up to pick up her children. As a devoted mother, the idea that Linda would neglect to pick up her daughters was beyond uncharacteristic. Paul and Evelyn Jacobs call friends and neighbors, hoping someone has seen their daughter, but with no sign of Linda, they contact the police. Linda had led what could be described as an exemplary life. She had never been in trouble with the law. She didn't drink or use drugs and was active in her church. Linda's parents informed detectives of what she was wearing and gave them a picture of her. The following day, as daylight swept over the area, it was all hands on deck in the search for Linda. The roads she would take her walk were rural. There were no street lights, and the houses that were there were not close together. On either side of the roads or forest and farming fields, when asked, neighbors recalled seeing Linda walk by, but they didn't have any additional information. Detectives then spoke with a man who lived near the intersection of Day and Mount Zion Road. The intersection is about a mile and a half 
From Linda's house, the man said that the day before his son heard gunshots and walked up a hill a short distance from their house and looked down at the intersection. The boy saw a car and a man loading what appeared to be a deer in the trunk. The boy's school bus would come through the area at around 3.30 p.m., which corresponded with the time Linda was on her walk. The investigators took this account seriously, believing it could be related to their missing persons case. Detectives hoped that with further questioning, 10-year-old Todd might remember something that could help find Linda. This is the deposition of Frank Todd Terrell. Deposition is also being videotaped. Todd was very impressionable, so he was interviewed very carefully and thoroughly. What did you hear? I heard some gunshots. Okay, all right, slow down just a little bit. How did you tell you were gunshots? Because my dad we, we used to go hunt you in that. He is severely hundreds of yards from where he was to what he saw. Yes. Okay, so you can see the road there? Yes. Did you see anybody? Yes. But he tries to tell the detective what he can. Todd said that he saw a man in a dark hatchback. Investigators asked Todd to bring them to the exact spot where he saw the vehicle and the deer. This is the location of the witness. Approximate location as he viewed the incident. This is a view from the viewpoint of where the witness stood. Detectives determined that Linda's walking route would have taken her through this exact intersection. They went down to where Todd said the car was, and about 15 feet off the edge of the road, they noticed a blood spot. It was a significant amount of blood, roughly 12 to 15 inches in diameter. However, they didn't know if the blood was animal or human, so they collected samples of the blood and sent them off for testing. Not far down the road, investigators located a spent shell casing. The casing was from a hollow-point bullet, which at the time was common amongst police officers, but not among the public. The discovery of the shell casings confirmed Todd's story. Investigators put out a county-wide alert for the dark hatchback. The description was shared among Three Rivers and Michigan State Police. The officers stopped, vehicles matching the description, and asked to look in the trunk, believing the hunter Todd saw may have seen Linda. Detectives are desperate to find the man. Was the man wearing glasses? Don't know it. Todd becomes a critical witness at that point. Investigators presented the idea of placing Todd under hypnosis, to see if he could recall any further details. Todd and his parents agreed. Start feeling your eyes getting heavy. Tell me everything that you see. A guy, it looks like a guy with a tip. What was he pulling out of the catch? A girl. Todd was probably the only witness at that point. He was critical to this case, and the detective did everything to find out what he knew because there was nobody else. In a desperate move to find the missing mother, Linda Van Buskirk, three River investigators make the bold decision to hypnotize a 10-year-old eyewitness. When he was hypnotized, Todd said that there was a struggle with the man and a woman out on the road near his house. Detectives visit Jacob's home and inform Linda's family of the worrying developments. The family is alarmed and terribly concerned, and the search for the dark hatchback expands as neighboring counties are notified. Linda's disappearance was heavily publicized and everyone was looking for the hatchback. However, they couldn't find the vehicle. Detectives pursued every possible avenue starting with Linda's ex-husband, Three Rivers police officer, Bruce Van Buskirk. Bruce and Linda were in a child custody battle after recently separating as an officer. Bruce carried the same hollow point ammunition found near the scene of Linda's abduction. With that in mind, Bruce remained atop the suspect list. With the young mother missing for more than three days, concern escalates when the blood report comes back from the crime lab. The analysis confirmed the detective's suspicions. The blood found at the scene was determined to be human. With the amount of blood and what Todd saw at the intersection, detectives were all but certain that they were now investigating a homicide based on the shell casings at the scene. Investigators knew they were searching for 38 or 357 caliber weapons, local law enforcement officers. Weapons were taken in groups to the crime lab and ballistics tested. 
The first batch included Linda's ex-husband, Bruce's firearm. In the meantime, investigators hope their eyewitness can help identify the man he saw on the road. Todd met with a sketch artist. Do you remember what this man's hair looked like, Todd? Yeah, he had his hair curled around. What do you mean curved the wrong way? This part here, you mean? Yes, it was that. A drawing was published from the eyewitness account of the young child, Todd. Police have published a sketch of the suspect. Does that look like him? Okay. The sketch made from Todd's account was circulated locally. Unfortunately, the man in the sketch was not easily identified, though the sketch did not resemble Officer Bruce Van Buskirk. Investigators kept him on their short list. The ballistics analysis of the guns came back and confirmed that the bullet fragments and casings found at the scene did not come from Officer Bruce Van Buskirk's gun. It's possible that he used another firearm, but for now, there was no proof that he was involved in a crime. Investigators turned their sights to the other man who had a close relationship with Linda Jim Brini. The owner of the property where Linda was living, Linda was divorced and Jim wasn't married. Jim hadn't lived in Three Rivers for long, so he was relatively unknown to community members and police. Detectives brought him down to the station and treated him quite harshly as they searched for what he might know. Shortly after the interview wrapped up, investigators confirmed Jim's alibi. He wasn't in town on the day Linda went missing. Six weeks passed with no new leads, and investigators fear Linda may never be found. In late spring, an urgent call came in from a phone line technician who discovered something strange 16 miles east of Three Rivers on a remote road outside of the town of Colon. The man found a partially buried body when the crime scene technicians arrived. The body was exhumed and sent for an autopsy. The pathologist obtained the dental records of the missing person, Linda Van Buskirk, and compared those records to the teeth of the body. The pathologist confirmed that the body found in Colon was Linda Van Busker. The autopsy was also able to rule out any assault. Linda had been shot a total of three times she was shot in the head shoulder and hand, based on the angle of the shot to the head. The, the pathologist believed that it was the final shot execution style. Linda's family was devastated by the news of her body being found. Detectives were determined to get justice for Linda and her family because of the remote burial site. They knew it had to be someone familiar with the area. Detectives spoke with the employees of a few nearby businesses. A gas station attendant in the village of Colon said that she saw Ricky Moore in town on the day Linda Van Buskirk went missing. Ricky Moore's father, Larry Moore, was a sergeant at the sheriff's department, and Ricky was a reserve deputy. Police learned that Ricky Moore lived with his parents in the city of Three Rivers, not far from the intersection where Lindo was murdered. The Moore family also had a cabin in Colon. Ricky was interviewed by the sheriff's department a couple of times and was cooperative. You know the officers or some of them there in Three Rivers? You're familiar with, yes, sir. Oh, are you familiar with uh, Bruce Van Buskirk? Yes, sir. My uh, Oh, I see. Did you know Linda then? Did you ever met her? Or? No, sir. Ricky told investigators he had been to his parents' cabin in Cologne the night of Linda's disappearance. He said that he had gone there to check for a break-in. It was also determined that Ricky was familiar with the location where Linda's body was found. Do you have one of those? No, I have been, no, sir. Yeah, yes, Though his vehicle does not match the one described by eyewitness Todd Terrell, Ricky agrees to let detectives search his vehicle. Tests yield no blood in the vehicle. Still, detectives are not ready to rule out Ricky Moore. Out there riding around and you saw this pretty girl. Oh, I'm talking about you, buddy. The interview had its desired effect. Ricky's father, Sergeant Moore, came and got him, and they both headed to their house, keeping the heat on investigators were not far behind. They went to the house, knocked on the door, and said, We're here to get the gun. Ricky was hesitant and tried stalling. His father got mad at him and said, 
Get your butt upstairs and get that gun. Ricky went upstairs and was up there for a couple of minutes. When he came down, the detectives described him as white as a sheet and sweating like crazy. He handed his gun to the detectives. The gun was rushed to the crime lab to be tested. Investigators then searched Ricky's bedroom with the permission of his father. Inside, they found hollow point bullets consistent with the ones found at the crime scene. The firearms expert performing the ballistics testing on Ricky's gun said that the barrel had been damaged. Can you explain how the gun became damaged? Try to clean the lead out of it. And you told me that you used a screwdriver to clean this piece of lead out? Right. Because of what was done to the gun, the weapon couldn't be matched to the evidence recovered at the crime scene. Searching for another avenue to aid their case against Ricky, Investigators asked Todd Terrell if he could identify the man he saw in a lineup. Todd looked through the one-way glass. Unfortunately, Todd said that he didn't see the person who had been at the intersection. The sketch of the person that Todd made did not look anything like Ricky Moore, with Todd being 200 yards away when he witnessed the attack. It was not unusual for him to be unable to recognize the man. In the meantime, the ballistics expert continued to fire rounds through Ricky's firearm until it cleared out enough that he could make a comparison. An investigator received a call from the ballistics expert. He asked the detective if he was sitting down. The expert said, I made him on the gun. The bullet fragments and shell casings from the crime scene came from Ricky's gun. This was enough for them to charge Ricky Moore with the murder of Linda Van Busker. The detective went to Ricky's home and put him in handcuffs. One of those rounds recovered come from your gun. Can't be. It's a positive identification. There is absolutely no doubt. And I would have had a gun so you kill myself and save all this hassle. Even after being charged, Ricky maintained his innocence. His parents believed him and hired a lawyer in an attempt to demonstrate his innocence. Ricky Moore consents to a polygraph, and the critical question the polygraph examiner asked was did you kill Linda Van Booskirk when Ricky said that he did not kill Linda. The test indicated that he was lying. When the polygraph was over, the examiner said to him, there's something I don't understand. Why did you do it? Ricky then asked for his father and his attorney while outside of the room. Detectives heard what they described as animalistic wailing followed by Ricky confessing to what he had done to his father. Ricky screamed out, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. With Ricky's confession to his father and lawyer, lacking a motive, investigators could only speculate. They believed that the attack was motivated as Ricky was described as a loner. Ricky had purchased a car from Bruce Van Busker, so he had been to the Van Buskirk's residence, which is where detectives believe his infatuation with Linda began. Detectives believe that Ricky stalked Linda for some time, and then on March 26, 1985, he approached her and made an unusual advance, which she rebuffed. Ricky's reaction was to kill her. Ricky Moore waived his right to a trial by a jury and was tried in front of a judge. Tensions in the courtroom were high. Ricky pled not guilty because of insanity. The prosecutors presented their case and showed evidence to support a conviction. With Ricky's attempts to damage the gun and bury Linda's body, the prosecution demonstrated that he knew that what he had done was wrong. On May 13, 1986, 14 months after Linda's disappearance, Judge Cordelia read his verdict. He found Ricky Lawrence Moore guilty of first-degree murder. The evidence presented convinced him beyond a reasonable doubt that Ricky Moore was the killer and that it was premeditated. In the state of Michigan, a first-degree murder conviction mandates a sentence of life without parole. Jim Briney, the man who graciously opened his home to the struggling single mother, recalled how kind-hearted and beautiful Linda was. Ricky Moore is serving a life sentence at Muscogon Correctional Facility in Muscogon, Michigan. The case ends here. Thanks for watching.